when it comes to like new students with designated winner, my my just my under like with a little bit that we've been doing it, uh, how would you approach like a day one, you know, or within the first couple months that <clears throat> they don't have that that firm grasp of the basics yet, right? So if you're like, hey, you know, go ahead, pass their guard, they're gonna be like. Yeah, I don't even know what that means. You know what I mean? It's kind of like goes with the conceptual idea to me. Like you have to have a like to me, you have to have a base, like a a, a foundation of like somewhat of knowledge in certain positions and understanding these things in order for these things to actually be effective. How do you implement them for like newer practitioners? So uh, I totally agree. As the, as a uh, as somebody who probably gets now put as a conceptual teacher, I think that you should not be full concept. This is just my opinion. I don't think that you should absolutely show only concept and be like, hey, I don't want to show any technique ever because it will limit people's uh, you know, creativity. I don't think that it's like that. I think that a lot of times the concept works more if you have more context, right? Mm -hmm. And our context is techniques. So um, when it comes to con conceptual teaching and things like that, uh, I don't want to ever people to ever think that I'm like, anti teaching techniques and stuff. I definitely still teach techniques, um, but I use them as tools to solve the con the, the concept. Right. Uh, and so like the biggest way to look at it though, from a, a low level person from a white belt is the same thing that we were just talking about with, uh, the video game, right? The more things that you add in, the harder it's going to be for you to, to focus on one. And so I will limit it so much. I will limit the game so much. So here is a, a a good example of that. And this is like, you know, we're still designated winners still in the infancy too. And so there are going to be people that figure out, hopefully now more people are, are talking about it, more people are trying it. So hopefully there are going to be people that are telling me different ways to, to grow it and do better with it. Um, but the simpler I can make the game, the better it is. Okay. So we had this idea of there's a precursor to every guard pass and the precursor is going to be control of the upper thighs okay so you think about any guard pass that you do whether that control is my shin with a knee cut whether it's my hand if i'm doing a leg weave whether it's both of my hands when i'm doing a double underpass control of the upper thigh is a precursor to passing the guard Okay. God damn it! I'm just I'm gonna pause real quick because I've just I'm like running through every guard pass I do in my I head, know, and I'm like I'm like God damn it! How come I've never heard that before? That's like <laughs> right. And so you think about uh, even a Toriando pass. Oh well, I'm not touching the upper thigh. It, yep. What do I do with my shin to actually finish the the Toriando pass, or my shoulder to actually finish the Toriando pass? I drop it to the upper thigh. Yeah. And so we can use this a few different ways. We can use it for guard passing, trying to control the upper thighs. Or for me, what makes more sense and is more fun and is super simple, you use it for guard retention. I used to teach guard retention and say things like, okay, never overextend your legs. Do this, do that, feet here, do this. Th I would have all these rules. And then, and I literally, I taught this way for years. And then one day I said, all of guard retention is keeping the person off of your upper thighs. Do not let them touch your upper thighs. So we're going to start designated winner at 20%. And it's not even a, a real jujitsu round. All you're going to do is you are going to have the top person try to control the upper thighs with their hands, with their legs, with whatever. They'll, they can be creative and they can have fun with it. But they're going to try to, and you're going to be active with your grip fighting, and you're going to free your upper thighs. So we start playing this game. And I literally have my purple and brown belts that have been with me since I opened my gym seven and a half years ago. And they are grasping the concepts of not overextending, of keeping your knees in tight. They're grasping these things through the game and not through, I've been teaching them these things for, for years and they're grasping them through the game. And so that right there was big, right? It was, it was something really simple and it was just a, a simple game. And we played this game for like four weeks and then we moved on to guard passing and on the day we moved on to guard passing, we were just doing a day of full on designated winner. I wasn't teaching anything on the night. And I was just letting you, we always call it like learning from the room. You know, we just have a really strong room. We have a lot of upper belts now. So you're kind of learning from everybody. There's a brand new guy on his first day and he was invited 
by a white belt who had been training for six months. And so I, I'm prepared to go help, but I'm just, you know, I'm curious. I'm just like watching what's going on. I'm like, I wonder what these guys are going to do. The timer's set. So I'm watching the six month white belt and I'm seeing he's explaining something. And then I look and they're playing a game and it's guard retention and they're playing off the upper thighs. And so literally the game was so simple that a six month white belt correctly taught another white belt to play the game. And without me at all, literally without my use at all, I did not have to help. And then later on the night, one of my tougher blue belts goes, Hey, this new kid is going to be good. And I go, why do you say that? He goes <laughs> intuitively. He knew how guard retention worked. I don't know how, but he was retaining guard on me. And I go, dude, he was playing the upper thigh game and the blue belt was like, no way that really like, yeah, that was all that happened. And so, uh, the, the, you know, that's obviously just more of an example than anything, but as long as you're keeping it really, really simple, you know, you can even keep it in the idea of like your job as the top person from side control is to keep the other person flat, right? That is what your whole job is. If you listen to me coaching at a tournament, people will be like, Oh man, you're so good at coaching live matches. I'm like, no, I yell the same crap over and over and <laughs> over again. And it's just, it's so structured now. Yo, I don't even coach anymore. My students are yelling what I would be yelling. Keep them flat. Keep them flat. We're not worried about Kimura, arm lock, anything. We're just worried about winning that fight. Keep them flat. We know that when we drill it in the gym, that's the whole job. Keep the person flat. If he's flat, he ain't escaping. And so we just start to do that. We start to play it that way. It helps with coaching. It helps with understanding. And you can take those things of like, okay, well, my only job is to keep you flat. And you start to find submissions off that. You start to, to find other things. And you can even, once somebody has positional sparred or designated winner sparred, uh, you know, side control for enough time, and they know that their job is to keep them flat, well, then you can start adding submissions to their designated winner. They know the real fight, the real thing that matters, and then you start to add those finishes and they start to actually get success with them and actually hit them. Does that, that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, for sure. 